So thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, my name is Jared Lyon. I'm a principal research scientist at the Arthur Royal Institute. Lucky enough to be uh, MCing today. And uh, welcome to our ARI seminar series. Uh, I'd like to be begin the presentation by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people whose country we are on at ARI. And I would also like to extend my respect to their elders, both past, present and future. Uh, for NADOC week, we're really excited to have Uncle Dennis Rose and Dr. Wayne Costa presenting on a partnership in eel research. Uh, this seminar is a, a really rare chance to dive deeper into the mysterious world of eels. The joint, their joint presentation, which is called On the Tale of the Eel, Creatures of Mystery, will share the importance of eels, both culturally and ecologically, and what we've learned through satellite tracking. So Dennis Rose is a good, a good Dijmara traditional owner from Southwest Victoria, has had a long involvement in natural and cultural heritage management. Dennis manages the Budgebim cultural landscape, which is one of the world's largest and oldest aquaculture systems. I think oldest, Dennis can fill us in on that later, uh, through his role with the Good Dinge Mirroring Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation. Dennis is also the chair of the Victorian Indigenous Seafood Corporation, and was involved in the establishment of the nationally and internationally recognised Indigenous Protected Areas program. The program has now voluntarily dedicated more than 67 million hectares of indigenous owned and managed lands as protected areas throughout Australia. So a great achievement. And I guess on a personal level, I've been lucky enough to know Dennis now for several years and can vouch that he is one of the nicest people you'll come across and a real passion for his community and his work. So welcome Dennis. Dr. Wayne Costa is a senior scientist in the Applied Aquatic Ecology team at the Arthur Royal Institute for Environmental Research. Much of Wayne's recent work has focused on movements of migration and migrations of freshwater fish species and the environmental water requirements of native fish. And his current projects include movement dynamics of silver perch and golden perch using acoustic telemetry, diadromous fish migration and links to flows using Passive Integrated Transponder Technology, or PIT tags, and the Oceanic Migrations of Anguillid Eels using Satellite Technology. So Wayne's all across the uh, tagging technology. And Wayne's a really hard worker and has a great focus on science, and we're really lucky to have him as part of our team at ARI. So I welcome them both and look forward to their presentations. I guess just before I hand back to Andy, just a quick note that we'll keep questions to the end. However, you can pose a question at any time using the chat function in Teams. Thanks, Andy. Do you want to get people moving? I think Wayne's going to go first. Yeah, I'm going to send it straight to Wayne. When you're ready, um, go for it. OK, you got you got my my talk. Yep. Oh, well, well, yep today, today I'm talking about eels in particular anguillid eels or freshwater eels with a focus on their breeding migrations. Uh, this work was established and supported initially out of an ARI capability fund as well as DELP grants for traditional owner partnerships and to support the Glenelg Hopkins CMA flagship waterways project. There's many people who have been involved all the way from Denmark, Sweden, the UK, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of those people. Anguilla eels are globally distributed across temperate tropical and subtropical areas. There's 19 species and a couple of subspecies. In Australia, we have five species, two of which are found in Victoria. They're the short-finned eel and the long-finned eel. And both of those are found from northern Queensland um, or mid-Queensland through to the southeast of um, the east coast. They're diadromous, which means they migrate between freshwater and marine environments. Globally, anguilla eel populations have declined substantially over the last 50 years or so, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere 
many species are classified now as threatened or endangered, and that's due to factors like barriers, dams, habitat loss and degradation. These are commercial catches of short fin deal and long fin deal in Victoria. It's not standardised for effort, but it provides an insight into population trends and, and there's certainly been a decrease, particularly for short fin deal since around the 1990s. And a large part of that period has encompassed drought, but, but not entirely. Eels have a really strong significance to Indigenous people, and that includes in Australia, but in many other countries around the world. And Dennis will touch more on that in his talk. But for centuries, scientists and philosophers have also been puzzled and obsessed with eels, particularly where they come from, where they breed. The Greek philosopher Aristotle was fascinated by them. He noticed ponds fill up with eels after rain and developed this theory that they spontaneously grew in the mud. The Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, he thought that they rubbed themselves against rocks and the scrapings came to life. In the late 1700s, an eel washed up on the shores of Camaccio, Italy, and it was examined by the anatomist Carlo Mondini. And inside the eel's abdomen were these frilled ribbons, and he realised or made the discovery that they were the female's ovaries. So that was a first. Uh, a young Sigmund Freud also worked on eels in Italy around the 1860s, and he, he dissected hundreds and hundreds of specimens trying to locate the male reproductive organs. That failed and he gave up and, and moved in a completely different direction to study humans. About 30 years later, an Italian biologist, Giovanni Grassi, made the discovery or the connection that these tiny leaf-shaped creatures washing up on the shores of Italy were actually larval eels, European eels. So a couple of pieces of the puzzle, but where they, where they go to breed was still a major mystery. In the early 1900s, along came the Danish marine biologist Johan Smid. He'd just married the heiress to the Carlsberg Brewery, and all of a sudden he had access to a lot of money. And because he had all these funds, he spent about the next 20 years searching for the breeding grounds of eels. He trawled and trawled the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Ocean looking for larval eels, and he found them around the Sargasso Sea, and that was a a huge discovery and at the time he, he speculated that for Australian eels they probably spawn west of New Caledonia and that was based on some records of mostly adult eels in, in some on some islands around that region. Ever since that discovery researchers have been trying to confirm the breeding grounds there's, there's been some recent catches of small numbers of mature Japanese eels in the ocean and also small numbers of the eggs using net sampling and there's even been attempts to film spawning of eels using underwater cameras. Artificially matured eels have been held in chambers and lulled into the water column in the ocean to attract wild eels, but, but no luck there. Electronic tracking devices have also been attached to adult eels. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent on European eels, but still no one has managed to track one all the way from the rivers of Europe to the Sargasso Sea. These are tracks of, of lots and lots of eels um, exiting some of the rivers around Europe, but not many of them went too far. Some got out to the Azores, um, but none got anywhere near the Sargasso Sea. When it comes to Australian eels, almost nothing is known about their migrations in the ocean and, and spawning. There's been one study published on their downstream migrations in freshwater, and that's some work that came out of ARI by Dave Crook about a decade ago. And there's been a handful of collections of tiny larvae over a really broad area in, in the Western South Pacific. So over the last few years, we started investigating the migrations of Australian eels, primarily the short fin eel and more recently the long fin eel. And that's involved using pop-up satellite transmitters to track ocean migrations and acoustic transmitters to track migrations in fresh water. Uh, this work has it's centred around the Fitzroy and the Hopkins rivers in Western Victoria. The Fitzroy forms part of the Butch Beam landscape, which is uh, now World Heritage listed because it's significant for um, traditional owners in, in terms of aquaculture systems, and Dennis will touch on that more. 
And the work's been a, a collaboration with the Bujbim Rangers, and so we've we've worked together on field trips, downloading data, uh, tagging tagging eels, and, and even recently doing some interviews with the ABC. And more recently, we've expanded the, the work out to some areas around Melbourne with with the support of Melbourne Water. Um, the the work's been a real journey. We've managed to obtain the first data on the oceanic migrations of Australian eels. We've seen trapped eels uh, eaten by sharks and whales, and, and we've had uh, tags pop off only after a couple of weeks. Um, we've searched for and found tags that have washed up on beaches, so lots of highs and, and, and lows. So I'm going to start with the acoustic tracking work we've done. This component examines the downstream migration of adult eels out of the Lake Conda system in Western Victoria, downstream through Darlitz Creek and into the estuary and out to sea. It's the beginning of the journey for the adults and, and pictured here is, is Lake Conda and also some of the stone eel traps, which Dennis will talk more about later. What we were interested in here was understanding when and how do eels depart the lake? What are the cues and, and, and how are they exiting the lake? In, in 2010, as part of the Lake Conda restoration project, a weir was built to raise water levels to re-establish the lake, but that weir forms a barrier for fish movement. So a rock ramp fishway was built to allow fish to move between the lake and the fishway. But there isn't always connection. A lot of the time it's dry. There is also a regulating structure uh, and an underground pipe, which allows, well, potentially allows eels to escape out of the lake. So we wanted to know to what extent were they using um, this fishway? Often it's dry. To what extent were they using the underground pipe? So eels were, were collected using fight nets. These are set overnight and retrieved the following morning. This is a shot of myself and, and Ben Church, one of the Butchbeam Rangers, out setting nets. And this is a handful of, of eels in one of the one of the nets. Lake Condor seems to have some of the biggest, fattest eels I've, I've come across. And here's a close up. These are eels all around the two kilogram mark. They're potentially decades old. And then tagging the eels with acoustic tags. These are small electronic devices that emit an underwater sound signal. And we set up an array of listening stations in the lake and also in the creek down to the sea. And, and, and these stations record the tagged eels whenever one swims by. So in terms of our key findings in terms of out migration, so this is the migration in, in freshwater. We found that they mostly move out of Lake Conda at night and mostly in spring through the fishway. That's when water spills over the lake into the fishway and downstream. But, but we did find some eels that moved in summer through the underground pipe when no water was spilling over the weir. Most eel movements out of the out of the lake also coincided with changes in lake levels. And in some instances, they were artificial manipulations. So as an, as an example, providing water for downstream users that was sometimes associated uh, with eels exiting the lake. So this is a chart showing times when individual eels, which are the, the pink bars, are exiting the lake. The blue line shows water level in the lake and, and the black line shows the height of the water level. So essentially above this line, the lake is spilling and it's connected to the fishway. Below this line, it's not spilling and the fishway is dry. So we see most eels are exiting in spring during a period of rising lake levels, but some exit much later through into summer. The fishways dry at this time, but we had listing stations set up on the underground pipe and, and these eels have actually gone through that underground pipe. So there's potentially a, a range of ways in which eels can, can get out if, if the fishway's not spilling, but often these movements are cued or associated with, with changes in water level regardless. Of the eels that get out of Lake Conda and move downstream into Darlitz Creek, they then move down to the estuary over a pretty broad time frame, so spring through autumn. And those downstream migrations are often quite rapid, 
and they're nearly always associated with rising flows in Darlitz Creek. Once eels get to the estuary, they can spend weeks or months there, and then they typically leave in late summer or, or autumn, and, and often it's around that the new moon, so that dark moon phase. These are two examples of eels that were residing in the lake and then migrating downstream. The coloured dots just show their position in the system, but essentially they're, they're up in Lake Conda. This one migrates downstream in spring, spends months and months in the estuary feeding and then, and then exits the system around autumn, late summer. Similar pattern with this one, although it's uh, migrating downstream much later, again on a, on a rising flow, only spends a few weeks in the estuary and then exits. But one of the key messages from this data is the importance of these rising flows to, to cue or facilitate downstream migration of eels out of the system. Moving on to the next component of the project, this is tracking the oceanic migration. So this is the final part of the journey. And this is some footage of eels migrating out of a small creek and into Port Phillip Bay taken in March this year around the new moon. These eels are moving from the creek over a shallow sandbar for a distance of about 10 metres and then into Port Phillip. So this is the last time they'll encounter fresh water. They've potentially spent decades and decades in fresh water and then they begin that long journey north to warm tropical waters where they breed and, and die. We observed about 20 eels or so doing this one evening and it's potentially a, a period where they're, they're quite vulnerable moving over these shallow sandbars before they make it into the waters of Port Phillip, which this one will eventually do. So that's the, the gentle waves of Port Phillip there lapping it at the shore and finally this eel makes it into that marine water and it's off into the darkness. So for the satellite tracking component, what we're interested in understanding is where, where do they go in the marine environment and what happens to them along the way and, and where do they end up? The only information we have in terms of their breeding ecology in the marine environment is a handful of collections of larvae drifting in the ocean. So once again, eels are collected using netting at night time. This is a shot of myself and, and Dave Dawes and out one night collecting eels. This is a small male eel. It its underbelly has turned silver and its dorsal or its top side has darkened. And the eye also darkens and enlarges and turns a hazy, hazy blue. These are some of the changes that they undergo as they migrate out. And, and this is a catch of eels from a, from a fight net. Mig they're migrating out to sea. These are caught only a couple of metres from, from the ocean. And you can see that distinct silver belly, the dark dorsal surface, which occurs when they're ready to migrate. And these are all likely males. They're much smaller than the females. They, these ones are only about a kilo in weight, and they tend to leave a bit earlier than the females. Um, and th these ones were all too small to tag, and so they were, they were released. This is one of the satellite transmitters that we use. These are about 10 centimetres long and about 40 grams in weight, and they're attached externally to the eel, and, and they pop off at a pre-programmed time and transmit data to the satellite network. In terms of our key findings from the satellite tracking, we, we managed to track eels from Western Victoria for a period of around five months, and they travelled almost 3,000 kilometres as far north as the, as the tropical coral sea off the northeast coast of Australia. Two of the eels migrated to an area west of New Caledonia, and that provides some support for, for Smith's, Smith's hypotheses that short-finned eels from Australia might actually spawn on the west side of New Caledonia. We found that not all eels travel the same way. Some access the deep water off the continental shelf by swimming directly east through Bass Strait, some access deep water by swimming south and, and, and swimming around Tasmania. 
So these are these are these are what I'm about to show are the end positions of the eels. It's a light base geolocation position. Many popped within three to four weeks after tagging. And that's a similar result to, to other studies on, on eels overseas. Some made it around the New South Wales coast after a, a month or two. And then a few months later, you get a couple pop up in the warm tropical waters west of New Caledonia. The, the tag which made it the furthest, uh, this, this one up here, it didn't actually transmit its data. It, it was found by a person fossicking on a beach on Lizard Island a bit further north. Um, fortunately, we were able to get the tag back. It had a damaged antenna and we were able to extract that data and that was a, a really lucky find. And these are the movement plots of two of the eels. And, and this is based on depth data. And interestingly, they take different paths. They're traveling at different speeds. So potentially they don't all go to the same area and they don't all breed it at the same time. And, and that's somewhat consistent with studies on other eel species in the Northern Hemisphere. The eels that we tagged exhibited these really strong vertical migrations moving up and down in the water column on a daily basis. So they're moving between the warm upper layers at night and the cool lower layers during the day. We found that marine predators like sharks and, and marine mammals such as whales ended many of the migrations, at least 30%. Many of the eels were, were predated before they got off the, the continental shelf. And we also found a relationship between the nighttime swimming depth of the eels and, and moon phase. Essentially, nights with a full moon, they migrate deeper, and that's probably a, a predator avoidance mechanism. These two plots here are the vertical migrations of one of the eels. So this shows its movement up and down in the water column. The plot on the left shows its initial movement in the first few weeks after tagging, but essentially moving up and down in the water column. And then once it, once it gets out further into deeper waters, it maintains that pattern, although moving much, much deeper down to about a kilometer at night. Uh, so essentially moving from cool, um, deeper waters during the day to warmer, shallower waters at, uh, at night. And it's been established that th these anguilla eels, they don't feed during their spawning migrations. And so these migrations up and down in the water column probably relate to avoiding predators, uh, swimming efficiency, and, and also control of uh, maturation. Many of the tags were ingested by predators, and, and this is demonstrated by sudden temperature increase and a lack of light that's recorded. For some, such as this one, temperature increases to around 24, 25 degrees, and that's indicative of laminate sharks. These sorts of predation events occurred during the day, usually about two weeks after release, while the eel was still uh, on the shallow waters of, of the continental shelf. Other eels were predated at night by an animal with a, with a stomach temperature of about 37 degrees, which is most likely a marine mammal, such as, such as a whale. And, and these results emphasize how oceanic predation has the, has the potential to regulate the numbers of eels that escape the continent and make it to the spawning grounds. And that's, that's really important information because um, typically stock assessments for eels are based on the numbers that leave the river rather than the number that actually make it all the way to the spawning ground. We also found that, that short fin eels occupy deeper water during nights with a full moon, and, and that behaviour is consistent with other anguillids such as the Japanese eel and, and the New Zealand long fin eel. We know that short fin eels are, are vulnerable to visual predators, and it's likely that they're at greater risk during full moon periods, so they seem to adjust their nocturnal swimming depth to reduce that risk. Outmigration of, of short fin eels from the estuary into the sea is, is also strongly related to moon phase. We found that in, in our recent work, and it was also a finding of, of Dave Crook's work a while back. And so it suggests that moon phase is a, a really important determinant in the migration behavior and ecology of this species. 
all of the tags were released prematurely from the eels, and that's either caused by ingestion by marine predators or by failure of the attachment. And, and here's a couple that we've we've managed to retrieve that were washed up on beaches. Um, the kids in that shot are actually Dave Dawson's kids who, who were on holidays and, and went looking for one of the tags and, and found it. And it's it's great to get these tags back. They're worth several thousand dollars each and they can be reused. And um, we can also extract the entire data set off a recovered tag, whereas the ones that transmit up to the satellite network, they only transmit a portion of their data. But we don't always get them back. One that we tagged around Melbourne recently, it ended up pinging around someone's house for a few weeks with the occasional visit somewhere else in the perhaps in the back of their car. And unfortunately, it was it was never returned. This is a quote from Johann Smith from about 100 years ago, just describing the excitement and suspense and disappointment of his efforts to unravel some of the mysteries of eels. And he spent 20 years working on eels. We've only spent a couple, but I can appreciate what he's saying. We've had tags pop off after only a few weeks, tags or eels get eaten by sharks and whales and so on, but occasionally some really, really exciting results. And finally, some acknowledgements. I'd like to thank lots of different people, um, but particularly um, some of the ones listed here. Um, one of our best data finds was from, from a guy, um, Fossey King on, on Lizard Island. Um, and here's a shot of a, a long fin deer, which we um, tagged and, and released recently. This is about 13 kilos um, heading off into the ocean to begin its journey. That's it from me. Thank you so much, Wayne. That was awesome. Such good footage. I'm really glad you were able to capture that this season. Um, Dennis, without further ado, I reckon we'll hand over to you. And just to let the audience know, we'll hold off questions till the end. Um, we thought it'd be best if Wayne and Dennis both answered questions at the same time. Um, but feel free to send them through whenever and we will publish them um, as they come through. Dennis, how are you going? Good, thanks. I'm just trying to download this. It says, are you sure you want to share? My share? No worries. That it? <clears throat> Perfect. Looks great uh, to me. I've surprised everyone who knows me that I managed to do this. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for allowing me to participate in, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge most importantly, our Gundichmara ancestors who, uh, who, by spending time and investing time and effort and resources into these uh, aquaculture systems, uh, constructed what we consider one of the world's oldest, probably the world's oldest that's in existence today, aquaculture systems uh, on the Budgebim uh, cultural landscape. Uh, the red dot there showing southwest Victoria down towards the South Australian border about 360 kilometres from Melbourne. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the other countries that people may be meeting on today, um, and uh, I'll get into it. Um, the budge beam. No, all right. Uh, the budge beam cultural landscape uh, contains one of the world's most extensive and oldest agriculture systems. I think that. Uh, Anyone who's been out on country uh, will uh, will understand that the, the scale of this. I uh, tell people that uh, you know, as a as a traditional owner group, that we didn't have much access to country uh, up until about 35 years ago. We didn't have much management control of, of properties. Uh, we've acquired properties uh, over, over the, the past 30 something years. Uh, all our properties declared indigenous protected areas. So we look after both the cultural and the natural values of the country. Uh, and uh, one of our major aims is, or well, certainly our major aim is to improve the health of country. Uh, that's, our, that's our paramount uh, objective in terms of, of, of looking after country, protecting both the cultural and improving both the cultural and natural systems. Uh, people are probably aware that, uh, in, in fact, uh, two years tomorrow, June, July the 6th, 2019, 
uh, we uh, received or inscribed on the uh, World Heritage List, uh, the 20th site in Australia, and I think uh, around about 1100th in, uh, in, in across the world. Um, it was a it was a great day. It was a, a culmination of a lot of work by a lot of people over a lot of years, and I think. Uh, as I, as I do my presentation, I'd really like to acknowledge that we've had great support, great partners over the years, and, and certainly our partnership with Arthur Ryler Institute is, is an example of, of how we operate. We, we operate on the basis that, you know, we don't have all the skills and expertise to, to do all the things we want to do. We rely on, on good information, good evidence, um, and, and some of the work that certainly a lot of the work that uh, We've been doing since about 2008 with ARI uh, has been really important in uh, putting the story together for World Heritage. That fella on the right's just whacking down the gavel uh, to uh, to say that uh, Budgebin was inscribed. A, a very proud day, and I think one that again we reflect on 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 the great work that our ancestors have done out on country over many thousands of years. We have a scientifically accepted date. Of six thousand, of at least six thousand six hundred years ago, um, that the, uh, the, the one one of the uh, aquaculture systems was first constructed. Um, just uh, a few images, uh, various uh, parts. This is around Tayrak or Lake Conda. Uh, we had a, a native title determination in in two thousand and seven. Um, and I think then it was it was certainly recognised that continuum and connection to country was recognised in our native title determination. I think that's the really important part that uh, people, uh, it's not just about sites and, and, and culture, uh, sites and, uh, uh, and, and animals, et cetera. It's, it's about the people and it's about the, the people using the, the Budgebim lava flow. You can see on the left there, one of our stone house sites, uh, you see the, uh, um, there and then on the right, uh, a few of our uh, Goodnich Mara ladies um, with eel baskets, uh, 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 making uh, out of the natural grass, the punya grasses, as it's called. Um, and uh, they continue today to to uh, make these uh, make these baskets and share the knowledge as well. They do a lot of work with both uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal uh, people, uh, particularly youth, to uh, to show the, the skills that they have. Um, and uh, we certainly uh, enjoy taking people out on country to to show them. I think I tell people that I go out and take a take a group out on country, and the, the country tells the story. Um, and uh, I just have the, the opportunity to sit there and report like that. It's uh, there. One thing that we want to make sure that we do, and I think that um, uh, we we want to make sure that our kids, our youth. Uh, as I said before, we have ac better access to country. I know when I was growing up as a teenager, uh, certainly we had to jump a few fences or uh, fish off, a, off, off the side of a bridge to catch a feed of eels. Uh, again, now that we have access to this country, it, it's, it's really important that our younger, younger people are, uh, are exposed to a, a range of cultural activities, not just about fish, of course, but uh, you can see there there's as uh, Wayne mentioned before, there were some uh, extremely large eels out at the lake. Uh, and on the right, there's a few kids uh, back in town uh, handling them just to have a bit of a play around with them. I'm assuming they might have had a feed of them later, probably, possibly. Um, but really important for, for our mob to, to get back to reconnect on country uh, and uh, uh, again, to understand and recognise what our ancestors did. Part of the native title uh, settlement, I think this is some really important statement here. Uh, Gunditch Mara were able to prove a strong and unrelenting connection to this area where their ancestors farmed eels for food and trade at the time of European settlement and back through the millennia. I think that it was recognised in the federal court that uh, eels in particular um, had a, an important part of, of our connection to country. Um, Here's a, a, a map drawn by a, a Crown surveyor uh, back in the, in the 80, 1880s, I should say, not 1980s. Uh, he, he went out with uh, a, a Gunditch Mara traditional owner 
um, over a period of a few years and uh, mapped some of the uh, some of the uh, aquaculture system. This is uh, the Muldoon's system down at the bottom of, of, of Tayrac, Lake Conda, um, and uh, it's it, it's been an important part of of our work. The uh, not only did he do a map, but he did a diary as well. So there's important information there about fish and whatever else. Uh, stone house on the left there, another st in situ stone house. And on the right, we have uh, uh, a smoking tree. This is a, a, a eucalypt that was uh, uh, used for, for smoking of eels. Eels were traded. I um, <clears throat> mentioned earlier that they're part of our economy. They always have been. As people are probably aware, eels are a fairly hardy uh, fish, a hardy, hardy animal, and uh, they uh, they were smoked uh, and 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 traded. So a, a smoked eel would certainly would travel some distance uh, before it was time to to be consumed. Um, interestingly, with the with the with the smoking tree, that uh, one of our archaeologists. Uh, decided to do a bit of a test. So she dug some some soil from the base of the tree uh, and, and wanted it um, wanted it checked out at the, the science lab. Uh, she put it in the freezer for a, a couple of weeks, uh, awaiting advice from the, from the laboratory. And they said, yeah, send it out. So she grabbed it back out of the freezer and opened it up and she could just smell uh, the, the smoke deal in there. She said it was just really strong and uh, for those who have had smoked eel it certainly has quite a distinctive uh, strong uh, smell and taste to it a very nice taste too i must admit uh, we still have lots of our mob eating eels um probably not as as much as, as we used to uh, i think i like <coughs> i like a, a feed of eel as a as an occasional uh, meal now rather than be part of my um, nearly daily or weekly diet at least um, but um, it was it was uh, uh, it, it's very nice, and we still get out and catch catch eels. Just a, a couple of an aerial image of part of the system. Uh, is my cursor showing up there, Andy? Yeah, thanks. Um, this is at the bottom of, of Tayrac, Lake Conda. Uh, over here, uh, you can see the the uh, the weir that was constructed. And I'll talk about the weir a little bit later, but uh, the weir that was constructed. Uh, and uh, uh, this is fairly typical of the system around the lake. The, the that's the, the lake on the right. There was a channel that was constructed through to join up with some sinkholes. Um, that the, that as the water rose, fish would uh, go in there. It's a bit difficult to see, but there's a, a stone weir across there. That was once the, the, those water holes were filled up, and eel and fish were in there. Uh, would be blocked off um, and there for harvest. Around the bottom of the lake here, uh, there are in excess of 70, in fact, I think they're close to 70 individual components of the aquaculture systems with the fish traps, um, just, just in that part alone. One of our other properties, uh, the Turandara IPA, it's, a, it's, around, it's less than 250 hectares in size. It's got 14 individual uh, fish trap systems Within, within the wetland system there. Over to the left is what we call the Muldoon's uh, fish trap, which was uh, that the scientifically accepted date of six and a half thousand years. As I mentioned before, I used to do a lot of fishing of eels as, as a young, young, young fella. Um, I reckon I, for many years, I thought I knew a lot about eels. I knew lots of different ways to, to catch them, different times of the year, uh, you know, a warm, Full moon in, in, in the autumn uh, was great for a particular um, process called bobbing of eels. Um, catch caught quite a, quite a lot in many different ways over the years. Knew how to cook them, how to prepare them for eating. I thought until uh, I thought I knew a lot about eels until 2007. We employed Lockie McKinnon, who's a well-respected eel biologist. And I realised then that I knew stuff all about eels. I knew how to catch eels about, you know, half a metre or a bit more in size and good eating eels. Uh, but I knew very little of, of their uh, of their uh, their journey of their life cycle. I think uh, it's been interesting uh, along the way about uh, what what I've certainly learned 
out there. So this combination of traditional knowledge and science has always been uh, really important. Uh, so fast forward a bit to 2004, we decided that we would uh, restore water to, to Lake Connor um, and uh, uh, took it took us a few years of planning and that's when the, the research that uh, Wayne mentioned before with Dave Cook and, and others at ARI in terms of the acoustic tracking and, and checking the health of, of eels and move, <coughs> movements of the eels was really important in terms of putting together our business plan for restoring water in the lake. Uh, the aspiration and objectives for the for the lake preservation of the archaeology, which is of world significance as we've, as we've established, restoration of wetlands of national significance, uh, re-establishment uh, biodiversity uh, as best we can, a uh, develop of an aquaculture bis business based on, on Kuyang, and Kuyang is a traditional name for eels down this way, I must uh, should have mentioned, um, and culturally developed, culturally sensitive uh, tourism industry. But there are some of the objectives of the lake. Um, as I mentioned, Dave and others uh, put together, did a, a, a paper, um, and I reckon really importantly here, the uh, three people, Danny Lovett, Adam Walker and Lucas Bannum, they're three of our budget beam rangers at the time, and they as you can see, they've got their name up there, but they certainly helped, participated, and did a lot of work with the scientists uh, on on the on the project. There's <coughs> Danny, uh, a budget beam ranger, and, and Jed, one of the scientists from ARI, doing some work uh, in planning an acoustic tracker, and I think also they were doing uh, health checks as well of, of eels, and also two pond was the other fish that they did some tracking of as well. If you watch the white dot here, this is a great image. Um, this tells a great story about the, the journey of an eel. Um, you know, if we took a, a sort of a large scientific report to our mob, uh, it probably wouldn't explain a real lot to, to some people. Um, we, we certainly, imagery like this certainly tells a great story. I think I said that an animated picture is worth 10,000 words, I reckon. I think that was the case for this one. Uh, this is really important information for us to gain a better understanding of, of fish and fish movements. Um, major outcomes of, of that research was that members of the local community, such as our budget beam rangers, had training and experience. Uh, and also, and, and, and equally as importantly, there was valuable opportunities for ARI staff to learn about Indigenous issues and cultural heritage of the lake. So it was a two-way learning thing, really important. Uh, getting back to the uh, to the lake, um, picture on the left, is 25 of our mob uh, <coughs> worked with the contractor to uh, to restore, do the, the weir at the lake. There's Uncle Ken on the right and, uh, and Rod Armstead, who uh, was the contractor, did a job. Uh, <clears throat> when our, one of our resident elders, a fellow who was standing in that stone house before, spent a lot of time out on the lake when water was in it in particular, uh, and uh, we we weren't never able, we knew that we were never able to restore uh, the lake back to its traditional height um, because of the impact of upstream farmers. Um, so we uh, we had to settle on a, on, a, on a level and we asked him, uh, what level would, would you be most happy with? And he whacked that nail in, you can see the nail there in the yellow paint. And if the water gets up to that height, he said, I'll be happy. And believe me, if he was happy, the rest of us are happy. And sure enough, after the weir was constructed, um, this was a little bit, the water was on its way down a little bit, but that's uh, where the nail was. The nail certainly got wet uh, and the lakes had water in it ever since. Prior to 2010, the lake would fill up in the late winter, early spring. Uh, the, the extensive drains that were dug through the lake and and also the Condor Swamp to the north of, of the lake um, meant that it drained out after four to six to eight weeks, depending on uh, on uh, on on the season. But uh, but since then, water's been in the lake full time, but, but at varying levels, it does rise and fall quite substantially. Just about finished, uh, World Heritage. Um, 
Now, I never paid this bloke any money to to say this, but at the uh, day of the inscription, he said, now we have an example of a perfectly management, managed site, an excellent example of effective management systems in place. We haven't got perfectly managed uh, management out there. Uh, I think we've certainly got a way to go. I think that we have very good management of both the cultural and the natural uh, values, uh, but we certainly want to do more work. And I think things like the satellite tagging, for example, really, really help us uh, uh, in terms of our understanding and knowledge, but more impo as, as importantly, also about our, our management of, of country. Uh, just on, on the fish theme, we've had a few of our budgeting ranges with some consultants doing some fish surveying as a site net there. They did a bit of electro fishing and again, gaining a better understanding of what's in, in the lake and uh, uh, in the system. Uh, and this is down at the estuary. They were uh, again uh, uh, doing uh, checks for eels and, and, and other fish. Uh, with the satellite tagging um, and acoustic tagging, we had a, two or three of our mob working uh, alongside and assisting the scientists, um, which was again really important for two-way learning. Uh, just finish off with our aquaculture system down at the lake. Again, part of our uh, aspirations was about tourism and sustainable tourism. This is what we call the aquaculture facility. Uh, this is our visitor centre, our World Heritage Visitor Centre at the lake, and it will have a real focus on, on, on the eel, uh, and that's a holding pond for, uh, for some show for, for, for people. That's it from me. Thank you. That was a bit rushed at the end, but um, thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's been a, a great experience and it will continue. And I think, as I mentioned at the start, look, we have really good partnerships with, 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 with good people, um, good, good agencies. It's, it's, it's been a, uh, always helped us, uh, and and we'll help them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. That was <laughs> exceptional. I, I enjoyed every moment of that, and I really appreciate you've come to speak to us all about it. Um, we have got so many questions today, um, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, the first one, Dennis, is I guess around the rarity and the, the uniqueness of these fish traps at Bujbim, but also um, whether or not you have any knowledge of other aquaculture systems in Victoria. Um, there is one that's been noted in uh, New South Wales, but the question here is just around the commonness of these aquaculture systems in Victoria. Look, there's, there's, lots, of, there's lots of fish traps around the world quite a lot, particularly in marine areas, and, and there's some substantial structures. If you were over in Hawaii, go and have a look at some of their uh, uh, fish traps that are constructed in the, in the marine area. Um, look, I think I think that what we talk about with Budge Bim is that we have an aquaculture system. We actually had our mob farming fish. It wasn't a, and again, I'm, it's, not saying it's any better or any worse or whatever than anything else uh, or any other system of, of, of harvesting fish, but it's a particular way. And this was an aquaculture system where we farmed fish. And as I said, coming out on country, if you come to Tirundara, for example, and see these 14 individual fish traps, you can actually see how it works. You can see that you know, there, there was uh, fish that were stored in a particular uh, water hole. Um, smaller ones were let through by the eel nets uh, in, uh, into the next the next water hole. Um, they were grown and fat, and the other ones were harvested or, or kept stored there. So it's a, comp a complex system. Um, as I said, there's 80, 80, somewhere up around 80 components of it around the lake. So it is about farming fish. Um, and yeah, Bree Warren is the other place that you're talking about there, Andy, that uh, up in the northern New South Wales has some extensive uh, aquaculture system there as well. Uh, look, one of the interesting things that we had to do, uh, what they call a comparative al analysis of budge bin, that was a bit difficult for us because we didn't, we always felt like we were sort of putting budge bin up there as, you know, being fantastic. Budge bin's budge bin, that's just the way what our, what our mob did, um, it wasn't to say it's better than anywhere else or, or, or whatever else, but it was a, just a great use of the resource that was available. 
Um, there are quite a number of lava flows in southwest Victoria, quite a few, but this is the only one that has uh, the scale of fish traps and certainly the stone house sites. Um, and it does that because they've had such a great water supply. Uh, our Dalits Creek, the system that runs through the through Budge Bim, uh, its traditional name is Kalara and means always there. It never, in my lifetime, it's never gone dry. It, it's a great system. Thank you very much, Dennis. Wayne, this next one's for you and it's about the migrations. How do the eels get back to fresh waterways of Victoria after spawning in the tropics? Well, they they essentially drift on ocean currents um, that they're carried by initially westward flowing and then southward flowing currents, uh, the East Australian current down, down the coast. And uh, at some stage when they get a bit bigger, they drop out of the current and presumably sense fresh water and then make their way into estuaries. So for, for a long part of it, it it's getting um, transported by ocean currents. And then when they reach a certain stage, they, they drop off those currents and, and then head into, head into the bottom end of or the lower end of, of rivers. And, and Wayne, add, to add to that, um, do the low flows during summer impact the migration of eels leaving the lower system? Um, or is it sort of the downtown? Actually, I'm going to ignore the second part of that question because I don't fully understand it. But yeah, <laughs> do the summer flows um, impact migrations? Flows are really important for reels. They migrate over a really broad time frame and they use those as, as cues to migrate. Um, and flows are also important in terms of providing the physical connectivity. So in, in really dry times, um, they might not get those cues and there might not be the connectivity. So if a, if a river has, has dried up into a series of water holes and then, then it may be difficult for them physically to move. So Maintaining adequate flows in rivers is, is a really important component of, of managing for eel populations. And we've seen with our recent work, the importance of, of changes in water levels at, at certain times of years, at certain times of year to, to help cue those migrations. And do you have any sort of rough ideas on the number of eels that migrate to the estuary each season? Um, it, I think it depends on, on conditions. So the acoustic tracking work that we did at Conda in, in the first year, we had about 5% of the eels that we tagged migrate downstream. And the following year, the, the system flooded, Conda, Conda flooded, and then probably about 70% of the eels that we tagged migrated out. So it, it really depends on the environmental conditions. During wet phases, I suspect a lot more migrate out than, than compared to during drier phases. I think if you talk to commercial fishers as well, they they, they strongly believe that those those patterns of, of floods and droughts uh, have a strong influence on on patterns of migration and their catches for, for eels. Thank you very much, Wayne. This next question's for um, De Uncle Dennis. Um, Maddie's asking uh, around the theme of NAIDOC week being about healing country. Uh, what role do you see for scientific research in healing country? Well, as I mentioned before, look, it, it really helps us make better informed decisions. I think that's that's really important. Um, I mentioned we have you know good strong partnerships <coughs> around, but I think. What people need to keep in mind is that you know, we 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 maintain control of it. It's the same with our World Heritage process, that we maintain control of, of the process. We get the best information we can, we, we work with some, some great people um, and that assists us. I think uh, you know, always describe our partnerships as as, as robust that we, we can tell each other um, what what, what we need to know, not what we want to hear. I think that's really important from the scientific community, but also important from, from our point of view that uh, we need to we need to be able to to have good, honest, and open dialogue to uh, to make sure that we we are healing country. And I think that that's that's the we all have the same aim. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Wayne and and Jared would would say that that their aims and our aims are exactly the same. Uh, or very, very similar at least, uh, and it is about healing country, improving the health of country. 
as best we can with the best possible advice, information. Uh, yeah. Well said. Thank you very much, Daz. Um, this one's for Wayne. Uh, you mentioned that eels don't feed during migration. Is that a response to reducing the gut size for salinity or osmosis regulation, or is it something to do with their gonad development? Do you have any updated research on that? I think one of the theories is that it's a, it's about reducing energy expenditure. When, when they leave estuaries and enter that marine environment, they're got a super high fat content and, and, and that those fat reserves are, are essentially what gets them to, to where they need to go. Um, if, if they were feeding on that four, five, six month journey, they, they'd, they'd be potentially expending a lot of energy along the way. So I think that's you know, probably one of the likely explanations. Yep. And this is an interesting question that came through. Do the eels often return to the place where their parents came from or is they spread around? Do we have any uh, research on that. Essentially what happens is, is so the larvae will drift on ocean currents towards fresh water. They're not necessarily recruiting into fresh water systems that their parents came from. Um, and, and then after 10, 20, 30 years, those adults will migrate back out into the ocean. Uh, we don't have a precise handle on where the spawning area or spawning areas are. And so whether whether an adult is migrating to the exact spot 20, 30 years later, we don't really know. We don't have a precise handle on, on, on where they're migrating to, but they're a bit different to, to um, other fish like salmon, which do undergo that natal homing where they, they undergo an imprinting process. Um, but, but eels don't, so, well, we, we're not really sure what, how they know where to go, um, but they're not, not necessarily migrating back to the same area. Good answer. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to one more final question um, for Dennis. Uh, this is around um, from a cultural perspective, what kind of personality or trait do eels have and how are they viewed by a community as spiritually significant? Oh, well, I think I think that um, their, their significance is really about just a, you know, a great food, food resource. Um, I, I'm not sure of any any uh, stories about sort of the uh, the spiritual side of eels uh, that I that I can recall, but uh, you know, keep in mind that you know, back in the in colonisation days, that uh, you know we we had a, a fair old disconnect with, with some of our traditional practice that was pretty much flogged out of us uh, through the mission days. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of I'm not aware of. Uh, sort of the the, the the spiritual significance of the eels. I I know that our mob certainly would have would have again. It's the reason why they they constructed and spent the time that they did with uh, with these aquaculture systems is to really provide a, uh, a, a a very permanent food resource there. Thank you very much, Ness. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you all for attending and I'd like you to join me through a virtual hand clap to say thank you to Dennis and Wayne for attending and for Jared for introducing the session. Appreciate all of you taking the time to share this with this brilliant audience we have. Um, I'd just like to remind people we do take a bit of feedback through a survey that I've posted in the question and answers. So if you do have time to fill that out before you leave, that'd be much appreciated. Um, our next ARI seminar will be during Science Week in August. Uh, we'll be presenting, we'll have two presenters from Arthur Isle Institute talking about eDNA, but also a really cool deep learning vocalization ID sort of um, project that we're working on. So some pretty interesting stuff there. Um, once again, happy NAIDOC week, everybody. Um, do celebrate and attend as many events as you can throughout this week. It is an important time for all of us, but I think we also acknowledge that um, recognition uh, of traditional owners is an all year thing. Uh, NAIDOC week gives us a platform to bring these ideas to the forefront, but uh, it's something we should be practicing at all times. So thank you all once again for joining us. Thank you, De Uncle Dennis. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jared. See you guys next time. My pleasure. Thank you.